Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. I want to wish you a very happy beginning of April. And we have our longtime friend, fifth time caller today, Dr. Irvine Shablatsim is going to be talking about parenting in with the Apostle Paul in the book of Revelation. So I'm sure you'll find it enlightening. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the OnScript podcast. We have, for the fifth time, a very special guest today, Dr. Irvine Shablatsum. According to his website, Dr., uh, Professor Dr. Irvine Shablatsum holds doctorates in physics and theology from recognized <coughs> institutions. He has won awards and competitions of various sorts. He runs a research facility in the Lake District in the UK with his friend Dave and carries out extensive research online. His, his primary areas of research include multiverse theory, the epistles of Paul, the book of Revelation. He also conducts research in paleoarchaeology, cosmology, and metaphorism. Mm-hmm. Professor Shablatsum, welcome back to the OnScript podcast. Five years. Five. <sighs> Wait. Oh, yes, our fifth episode. This is a... Oh. Of our fifth episode. This is our fifth anniversary. This is the fifth time our minds have come together to make this, you know, these works of art that we put together, you know, every year. So I think that's a celebration. I think, I think, you know, and it's sig- significantly to go. Sorry if your listeners, we're going to go straight into some biblical stuff right now. Five, five books of the Pentateuch. Average human has five appendages per foot. The signs already, you know, what look at the significance of that. When you combine the Trinity, which is three, Matt, with the sky and the ground, you get five. Five, yeah. You know, the Roman Empire collapsed in the fifth century. And maybe that's not maybe that's not great. Yeah. Yeah. Special times, Matt. Special times. Yeah. yeah. Glad well, to be back. Hello. Yeah, it, it, hello. Yeah. Hello to all our listeners. And um, yep. I, th- I think this is a significant episode, not only because of it being the fifth one, but also because you've kind of taken a turn in your research in moving Mm. toward uh, writing this book that we're going to be discussing today, Rearing Children with the Apostle Paul and the Book of Revelation, which I'm really excited to talk about. It's uh, available on on Amazon and and various platforms. Um, uh, And and you made a note there that said um, some uh, platforms may want to de-platform the book, but you're uh, you know, insistent that it stay available to people. So hopefully our listeners will be able to access the book. I just wanted to touch that, that last year we I did try that if you remember I tried this model of where we redacted the book and it was a it was a sort of tiered payment system. So if you paid nineteen ninety five you got half the book and if you paid sort of forty dollars you got all the book. That kind of it led to a lot of confusion. Um and so it's just a straight up I've taken I've taken a, 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 a leaf out of your book, you know. A pay, I've taken a page out of your book, as well as that for a <laughs> pun. I've taken a page out of your book, and it's a flat fee now. It's like your book, eighty nine ninety nine. Take it or leave it. Straight up there. All right, you get everything this time. Okay, it's a big great. book. It's so gonna, it, this one's going to have traction, I think, Matt. Mm-hmm. It's a big, good yeah, subject. So, this is. Yeah, so it comes in at six hundred fifty pages. Sorry. Rearing children with the Apostle Paul in the Book of Revelation, and. Um, uh, as we were chatting before you know, we hit the record button here, you mentioned that you've got some news uh, to share with our listeners. So I'm wondering if you would yeah, just give us an update so, on what you've yeah. been up to and some of your research. And As always, Matt, my pleasure. So we, we, we convened to this time last year. From that moment, I thought, what's next? I knew this was coming up. I knew this was coming up. I've got to have something ready to go. So, you know, I was I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do? What are the great mysteries of life? What needs tacking? What needs sorting? And... Uh, Lo and behold, as my your regular listeners will know, my my good friend and colleague and uh, helper and sort of you know part time butler type guy Dave is found a partner mm. out of the blue mm. 
found a partner. Special someone. Special hmm. someone. And that kind of changed the dynamics a bit. So they got married. And he broke the news to me the other day that they are with child. And I thought, I don't know much about this. This is a new era to me. Love women and children. But, you know, that's an area anybody can get into. The Bible is full of children. It's just, it's like, it's like a tea bush, the Bible. You just got to go along and pluck the leaves off, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, obvious step next. I'm an expert in Paul, Pauline theology and there must be stuff in there. Had a little look, little Google, you know, you can search for, for like for words in Paul's teachings and, you, and the children, who knew? Even as an expert myself, I didn't know he talked about children, infants, children, birthing pains. I was like, gosh, what a revelation. So um, how, what would Paul say today? Yeah, yeah. If you walked up to him and said, I've got children, or I want children, or I've got a child inside me, you know, what, what would he be his thoughts? He probably had those questions when he was traveling. So I spoke to Dave and said, Dave, I've worked out what to do. Two birds, one stone, right? I will write a new, a new tome on the Pauline understanding of child, child, childs, and I will write it and he can have the first copy signed his for he gets the first copy paul's kind of it, to me it's a kind of rearing children through the lens of pauline theology i think that i think that was quite exciting this was many months ago obviously i was like this there's something here there i do you know what there is something here um yeah he actually said i'd prefer a new buggy but i mm. looked into that and that's super expensive so i was like no nah, screw that so the tome it is so i think he's come around uh you can't you can't carry a baby on a book but you know I think this is not only going to be good for them, but good for everybody. And I think you've got to, we've got to look at life like a walnut. He could have had a buggy, which meant for the couple, first couple of years of that, that child's life, it gets to be pushed around on wheels, right? There's now not a buggy, so it'll just learn to walk faster, surely. Because if, if it has to walk to the shops rather than take its buggy, then, you know, so I think there's, I think it's about silver linings and stuff. There's a gift in everything. Even if you get disappointed in life, Look at the bright side. So that child, I think by the age of like, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 months, will be walking. So that's and, and as you as you put in your book, uh, you actually commented on buggies, and maybe now I know like what's behind it. You you talked about you said like why would you put your child in something that's facing away from you and push it? Like, do we even know the long term psychological impacts of that of pushing your like if if for the first three years of their life they're being pushed away from you? Oh yeah. That probably explains a lot that about that was in, the, I think that that explains a lot about Western postmodernism. You know, in other countries, if there's there's probably less buggies. Let's be honest. So they probably like hold each other. And um, whereas in the Western culture, as soon as you can, let's be honest, sprog goes in the buggy. See you later. So I think there's definitely, uh, and I think even if even if you get one of these fancy buggies where the baby's facing you that's just weird have you ever been on a train when it's going the other way and you're pointing the wrong way i get i get pretty sick and makes me want to vomit so i think that poor child's so confused it's like looking at you but it's going backwards so like i don't know that just seems a bit you know weird to me yeah so matt this is a for me this was an exciting theological journey as you can imagine i think that i'm not like mia culpa it's time for mia culpa as normal we have a mia culpa every every show i think uh i'm no expert in this field you know, and I've read some of your works and I can see that you're not an expert in things you write about. So um, for me, that's a bravery that I really aspire to be like, you know, just to throw some stuff at the page and see what sticks. Not really a clue what you're talking about, but I think so that's brave. I think I'd, I'd do more research before I put it on paper, but you just seem to go straight ahead, which is great. So for me, I'm not an expert, but you know what? Let's all become the expert on what we want to talk about. That's the mission, isn't it? You know, that's something to live by. Get Become the expert you want to be the expert on. So research, Matthew. Step one. I always say this to everybody who asks me, where do you start research? I have some issues, right? I have some real issues. One, for this journey to begin in most cases, you need a suitable partner. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you've got experience in this area yourself. You find a suitable partner. You you court that partner, and then you create offspring together, right? Um, I have no partner. I, to me, I read, I did read a whole book on courting, and gosh, that sounds like hard work, freaking exhausting. And then, then you got the offspring stage, and I'm, I just, yeah. So, no children of my own, no experience. So, 
and again, it's like anybody. If you've got not any experience of something, you have to find the nearest thing. And where do we turn? Science. We turn to science. What do scientists do? You know, they substitute real people for animals. It's right in my ballpark. This isn't it? You know, well, well apart from the restraining order and the rest of it. But this, you know, you know, I have a passion for animals. We talk yeah, about let this me just, let me, let, year, Yeah, let me just pause on that point because I, I thought that was really insightful. How you, you talk about how scientists often use. Um, lab rats in their research yeah. for medicines that are going to be used yeah. on humans. And, and that yeah, was yeah. sort of the analogy that you thought about with animals thinking about yeah. real children. So unpack yeah. that a little bit. So for me, you know, um, I'm going to be honest now, another mea culpa too. Um, I also find, I mean, I find children quite annoying, let's be honest. So it's the, it's the, it's the noises and it's the way they talk and it's the consistent questions what's this? Why is that? Why are you doing that? Where are you going? I'm like, no, no rat asked me that. You know what I mean? So I think scientists may have, that mean one of the reasons why scientists opted for rats is they were just like, who wants a noisy lab rat in a cage, teach it to send Facebook posts or whatever you're doing with your rat. Not going to complain. Is it? It's not going to, it's not going to be like, Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I'm tired. None of that. It's just going to be sitting there doing the thing you've asked it to do like you know you see them in mazes and stuff don't they like clever stuff and crows that that kind of get nuts out of tubes and stuff you know no one's complaining so i think uh, for me that that was my attraction towards the substitution of of humans with yeah they're highly without... compliant yeah 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 compliant yeah but still have that now kind of like um you know that kind of mystical fascination with their surroundings and stuff, which I'm assuming children have as well. They're like, "Oh, what's this? I've never seen a tomato before. Do I eat it? Do I throw it? Do I stick it in the VCR player?" And I think that kind of dynamic that a child has brings to a family unit. Um, probably a rat could do. I mean, I know a rat's not got like really like arms and disposable thumbs and stuff to be able to kind of grip a tomato and put it into a VCR. But, you know, I th that's, you know it sounds like a really interesting experiment, actually. I'm just going to write that down <laughs> so I can note that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, back to the, back to your original question, roll for the audience. Let's roll back to the original question. Um, what was the original question, Matt? Just remind me again. Well, j just, if you could unpack the, you know, your decision to use animals, what was behind that and, and your process, your method. So A plus B equals C. No brainer. The expression in this country, we have no brainer. It means was the obvious choice. Now, Mia Culpa number three, as your listeners will know, having listened to all of the very previous podcasts we've done together, I have had a, I think what you Americans would call a brush with the law. And I think that um, my brush with the, with the law uh, in this country, uh, led me to be um, um, a restraining order against animals. Good news was, it's actually hooved animals because of the because of the incident with the goat. The the court order is just around hooved animals. Yeah, just so, so our our listeners um, who may have forgotten or didn't listen to that episode. Um, so uh, Dr. Shablatsum has a restraining order against him to be within how far of any hoofed animal? I forget what uh, hundred exactly feet of any hoofed yeah. animal. And, and so it was, uh, cows, deer, I, I, should, I should be clear, deer. it was due to a, a serious misunderstanding. Yeah, that's um, what it was. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a misunderstanding with me dressed as a goat and a goat. And, you know, you can listen back. We don't really want to go there. It's still, it's still a bit tender, but a bit raw for me, really, to be honest. So right, anyway. Well, let's move past that then. Let's move um, past so, that. So, hooved animals but then you've got other animals and so that's where you've gone with so, this parenting yeah i wanted to avoid any kind of the neighbors ringing the police as they do and stuff like that so i thought i'm gonna leave my and, and sorry just matt let's let's just introduce your listeners the, the the vocabulary i'm about to use it can be quite uh confusing but i'm gonna i'm gonna really raise the science temp the scientific temperature of this podcast because we're using science and i don't want to sort of um melt it down for your listeners i think your some of your some of your listeners are probably you know quite some of your listeners probably get this kind of stuff so in my habitat which is what i would call my house um i didn't think that bringing animals to me was the answer so what's the next answer go to the animals their habitat their natural wonderful habitat where they thrive okay i bet you've got a lot of that in the lake district we have so like, you know, so the lake district is full of wide open spaces, huge mountains, lakes. You've got the fish, you've got the, the birds. Um, Mia Culpa number four, 
I did take my take a little bus journey out and um going to be honest it's quite rainy and it's pretty cold and I did stand on the shores of a lake for about 6 hours and saw nothing so I, I've resulted to the next best thing sort of the 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 sort of natural environment for most exotic animals in Britain the United Kingdom of Great Britain and that's a zoo so I found a local zoo got myself an annual membership thank you very much uh went down to the zoo a world a literally a world of animals at my fingertips well but in cages and, and behind you know fences and stuff but you know as an analogy the on the tips of my fingers um so that became my research center that's become the place where i can start to apply pauline theology with a, a susan of revelation in this kind of place so does that all make, is that all clear to you matt I, I know you Ab- sometimes don't. Absolutely. Why, why don't you talk a little bit about um, some of the things you, you, uh, you know, just to, I was, let me return for a moment to one thing real quick here. So you're, we're mm-hmm. talking about rearing children with the Apostle Paul in the book of Revelation. So you've got a couple things going through the, on through here. Through the prism. Through the prism. Through the prism. I know, of, I know it's not a title of my book, but it, it, it yeah. went to public, you know, I published it and then thought that's, that's a crap title. So I've got a new working title. So I'm going to, yeah. so it's the, through the prism. So I, I so you, so you're observing animals to make scientific Correct. observations that Correct. then you're you're also seeking to corroborate with uh, the Pauline epistles and the book of Revelations. You're holding a lot together here. It's a really mm-hmm. integrative project. Um, what are some of the things that you began to notice and what do you see as the significance of this work? So, Mia Culpa number five. Matt. Have you ever had bear feces thrown in your face? No. I have. Mm. It's one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. That sounds awful. I, I found a mummy bear, a daddy bear, and a baby bear, which fitted the model of observation I was looking for. I heard that there were, it, was, it was a new one, so it was fresh off the you know shelf. And I was able to get to the cage early in the morning, heard it had arrived, but the mummy, I don't understand, but the mummy bear was like keeping it all kind of close to her and hidden. I couldn't really see it. So I got a big stick and I poked the bear and she threw feces at me, um, which I thought was put out of order. I just wanted to see the baby, to be honest. So they, and I really feel like they should put up a sign that says Mm. something like, I don't know, off the top of my head, Mm -hmm. don't Mm -hmm. poke the bear. Um, So anyway, so I had to, I had to represent myself. And, uh, you know, what I was really looking for in that experiment was to kind of just see that first initial bond between the mother uh, of the baby bear, mummy bear, say daddy bear, mummy bear, and baby bear. So mummy bear. Now, um, so uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people are listening to this and wondering about how you make the methodological jump from uh, observing animals in a zoo and and then make it drawing conclusions about human children on the basis of observing animals in the zoo. So how did you wrestle through that challenge? As always, Matt, what a great question. Do you know what? Every single year, I think your question is getting better. I don't know if you're reading more or you're listening to other podcasts, like well-known ones with good presenters that you're picking up tips from and stuff. Or if you read like a book, like, you know, they get these idiots guides books to like being a podcast, somebody, you know, a podcast guy or something or lady, sorry, that guy, lady. Um, and, uh, cause I think there's that question's a, a, a strong question. Can I give you some advice though? Mm, mm, I think yeah. a better question would have been, do you feel really wronged by what's happened to you with regards to the law? Cause I would answer this. I dare not use your, I know you've got a massive audience and I dare not, you know, use the public the domain to, to argue my case but or let's let me let me be absolutely clear that i was it's a huge injustice right you talk about the restraining order yeah, absolutely and let me give you some clear examples as to why and why science should not be taped down let's just say if newton had been banned both from sitting under trees and couldn't get 50 feet from an apple would we even know today if gravity existed hmm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What if question. the RSPCA or, or animal control knocked on Ivan Pavlov's door and went, we hear you've been doing some experiments w- with your dog, something about 
saliva and bells. Well, would we now know as a society, you know, that when a dog salivates, you can ring a bell? We wouldn't have that kind of knowledge without that, you know? What if what if Aristotelian's tape tape measure had been taken off him? You know, they're sharp. Tape measures can cut people. You know, what if they taken off him? We would st- we still there'd be people out there today who think the world is flat still. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Those are yeah, really good points. So I'm just wondering if you could um, talk about like the you know, given all of that, given the injustice and your decision to move ahead with with zoo animals, like. W- what are some of the, you know, maybe some of the points you learned a lot along the way from different zoo animals? My my method is the embodification in a, in an anthropological sort of thought process. You know, it's not like you you have to become one with the animal. It's not like I think I'm an animal, therefore I am an animal. None of those kind of classic psych, philo, philosophical and cl- um, psychological sort of nuances. For me, it's crystal clear what I'm trying to do. Yeah, that's helpful. Like, um, let's take let's take you as a prime example. Let's do a little experiment on you, Matt. You know, so you're 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 you know, if it's mastermind, you, I think like your chosen area would be, um, you know, violence in the Old Testament, right? How do you how are you going to get from where you are now as a sort of kind of hobbyist through to being sort of a professional? You have to at some point choose to make that step, don't you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, like the people who the other people I've been listening to your podcast in between this ones and the other people who do the podcast, they're just they're there. They've got it, you know, and I couldn't be clearer. You are the master of your own destiny. Yeah, that that's As helpful. To, thank you. Thank you yeah. for that in, encouragement. Anytime. Um, anytime. I'm wondering, like you, you also talk about giraffes and, you know, toward the end oh. of your second major part of the book. So um, this is, uh, yeah. Yeah. A prime example. We, we, we want to turn. I think I think there's something for, for theologians to really grasp this day and age. It's all right, all the big words. It's all right, all the kind of volumes, 16 volumes of this and stuff. But do you know what? What people want is nuggets. It's, we live in the postmodernistic social media, Twitter, tweets, Instagrams. You can't be like, you want to know the secret of being a good parent. Go to go to volume 14 of my tome, da 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 all the rest of it. You need stuff that lands. The answer to that, my friend, giraffes. When somebody is complaining about lack of sleep, which I hear some parents do, think of the giraffe. The the hum I mean the very tall, but yet humble giraffe. Average sleep for a giraffe per day, 1.9 hours. <laughs> Do you see a giraffe on Facebook posting how tired they are, drinking 14 cups of coffee a day because they've had only six hours sleep? No. Contextualization of your lived experience is one of the fundamental building blocks to understanding good parenting. You know, I can't make any clearer. So, so you know, if you want to get a little, a little giraffe to have in your pocket or, you know, a, I mean, uh, what I thought was a, a really reminder. good idea, yeah. giraffe bedding. To get bedding that's got little giraffes on it, so when you get up in the middle of the night to, to um, you know whatever you do with the offspring when they wake up, little reminder there, giraffes. You know you've been asleep for four hours. Giraffes done, dusted. It's up. It's off. It's doing its day. I'm sure that will be really helpful to a lot of sleep deprived parents. Yeah, yeah. I would say now. Now you you talk about the uh, 10 a.m. principle. I thought that was uh, fascinating. So you're you're at the zoo. You know, bring us back to that moment and what you observed and what you conclusions you drew from that. So, as you know, Matt, 10 is a massively biblical number. You know, there's so much evidence that 10 is is probably the. I know everyone goes on about three and seven, but for me, 10 really jumps out there. And I obviously I've been at the I've been at the zoo for many weeks, and at 10 o'clock every day. The, the the there was a there was a young a young lass who came out with a bucket full of food. It was particularly the otters. Ten o'clock every day, that lass would come out with a bucket of fish and feed them. And I was sitting there thinking, how the heck did those otters manage to train the 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 lady to come out and give them their food at ten o'clock every day? It's mm-hmm. amazing. It's a good question. It's absolutely amazing. So I think that you know, applying that kind of stuff, I think, I think that the people think the natural world is all about chaos and chance and risk and and you know anything can happen at any moment and we can't predict the weather, all this kind of stuff. I think there's a lot more routine in it than we think. 
It's just that they don't. I think it's the animals don't show us. So I think secretly when we're not around, the animals are pretty or have a good routine. So I've come to learn that routines are actually natural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think I think a, I think a biblical baby routine, as I've called it, is the seven and ten principle: feed at seven, feed at ten, and then feed at seven and feed at ten again. So four times, no matter what the age. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, I mean, so, the, the, the so seven, seems, seven because it's another biblical number, right? Was yeah, that, I was, was just going 10 and 10, 10, 10, uh -huh. 10, 10, 10, uh -huh. 10, like the otters. But then I thought, I'll just get, you know what it's like, Matt? I bet you've had this. You have a good, a new, really biblical, biblically grounded thought. You always get a naysayer. You always get somebody going, oh, 10, 10's not the right number. Seven's more biblical. So I was like, well, I'll just throw in ten, seven just to keep the seven, the seven people happy. Um, three, I didn't throw in because that be you have to feed at three o'clock in the morning. And I think no one wants to get up at three o'clock in the morning and feed somebody. Yeah. And, and you, you talked in your book, you had a section, you talked about like, um, my visit to the, I think you call it the insectary. Um, and you mm. talked about the praying mantis. So what are some things you observed about the praying Gosh. mantis? An animal that prays to the Lord. Yeah. So I went into the insectary. And I said, oh, I want to see this praying mantis I've heard about. And he was like, oh, he said, come over. He said, shh. He went, shh. And I went, okay. And he went, shh. And I went, okay. And he went, can't be quiet. And I went, why have I got to be quiet? And he went, the praying mantises, the mummy praying mantis and the daddy praying mantis are having a mummy daddy cuddle right now. And I was like, okay, I'll be quiet. So we crept over. And I was hoping post cuddle there would be some praying you know i think these you know they could have got quite long arms i thought you know, put your hands together and um she ate him she oh, literally wow. ate him right in front of me mm -hmm. so and i looked at the guy thinking where's the horror and he was like nope that's what they do and then i realized the praying is not the praying that we know when we hold dear Um, if you had to pull, you know, when you're getting a long end. We call it a long end in this country. What do you call it in America where you've got a piece of thread uh, hanging uh, down? We, we, I think we call it a loose thread. Oh, we call it a long end. So if you've got a long end and you pull on it, you, you, it unthreads, doesn't it? All the way through your jumper. If there was a long end hanging out of the Bible, it would be sacrifice. Profound. Yeah. So, yeah. So absolutely. The praying mantis, the ultimate sacrifice. Gosh. Absolutely. Yeah. Is, is there some leg? There's some there's some legs on that. I think we should let that run. Um, you you gave a, a sort of broad sweep in talking about like how the Bible is full of good parenting examples. I'm wondering if you could just talk about that and 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 why you some of the things you noticed. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, I googled the Bible for good good examples of parenting, and um, Hannah, mother of Samuel, <laughs> excellent. Joseph, father of Jesus. Eunice, mother of Timothy, solid, rock solid examples of good parenting. A few more nuggets for you. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, no issues there. You've got Samson's parents, Eli and Hophi and Phyllis. David, all his kids, you know, who wouldn't follow that? Jacob, he had his head screwed on. And, and you know, like, even in, you know, Jacob, you know, he favoured Joseph. Even Joseph's story. Isn't that great, is it? You know, Joseph and Technical Dreamcoat, at the end of it, even after all that, he got a Broadway show. All right. So we've got, we've got a listener question here. Um, and it's uh, it, it seems like women get the raw end of the deal in terms of the pain of childbearing. And probably uh, the listener is mm -hmm. probably referring back to Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yep, yep. How do you wrestle through the, the apparent inequality in terms of the suffering and, and pain involved with mm. pregnancy and childbearing. Mm. With questions like that, you know, we turn Paul, he's got the answer. He's got the answer. Let's look at Galatians. Shall we, shall we, shall we look at Galatians 19 for my dear children for whom I, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth. Now, from what we know about Paul, he didn't have a baby inside him, right? So he was a guy who was experiencing pain. So I think what, what we can extrapolate from this is pretty straightforward, maybe uncomfortable, but it's, a, it's, it's what he's trying to say, I think. Men also have their own childbirth pains, 
when you if your ankles swell up really big, no doubt they are the one who has to go out to buy new shoes. You know, I think I think so. What Paul's trying to say here is that you have to. We haven't reached the stage of the seahorse. You know? Yeah, talk about the seahorse principle. You mentioned that in your book. So clearly, so you brought clearly that up. Mm-hmm. historically, at some point for the seahorses, there came some kind of arrangement. You know, the the the, the again the female species of seahorses probably decided that we've been doing this for t- long enough. Oi, Jimmy, you need to get involved. So the the the, the daddy seahorses they carry the young. You know, obviously we're not there yet as met as human beings, but. I think that is a good pr- principle of equality, but we can't make we we don't want the pendulum to swing, to swing too far. I think men still need to be, as Paul clearly states here, held up to, to and acknowledged for their pain during pregnancy. You know, I think there's a definite need for that. How would you advise parents whose children are constantly bickering and arguing about what's fair? Easy, create a lake of fire, throw all their toys in, right in front of them. Biblical as you can get. Biblical as you can get. Revelation. A lake of sulfur, lake of fire, in your garden, toys in, bish, bosh, bong. Well, uh, Dr. Shablatsum, I want to I thank you so much for these parenting insights from the world of science and from the letters of Paul in the book of Revelation. I think this has been a rich example of the integration of science and theology. And um, Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm sure our Listeners who are parents or who are looking after kids will find this very helpful. So thanks so much. I'm sure they will. Remember, if you're tired, think of a giraffe. Yeah, that's good. Hour and a, hour and a half of sleep, is it? Or 1.9 hours? 1.9 hours on average per day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nothing to complain about. Contextualize yeah. your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thanks so much. Cheerio. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study donate.